it's like a uh, tech industry. Are, are you okay? Like <laughs> they're not, they're not like I have, it, it's rare that you see an industry so blind to the future, especially one that is fixated on the future. Exactly. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, it's an industry that's still dominated by young um, men. Um, there has been some racial diversity, uh, but very little gender diversity um, and zero age diversity. It is appalling. <laughs> and what worries me about this is not only is tech as an industry missing out on a real opportunity here, not just from a workforce perspective, but also from a customer perspective, that's problematic. Welcome to It Gets Late Early. Today I have with me Bradley Sherman, who is a demographic strategist as well as the author of a book called The Super Age, Decoding Our Demographic Destiny. Welcome to the show, Bradley. Thanks for having me. I'm so pleased you're here. So first and foremost, let's kick this off. What is the super age and why should we all care about that? Oh, we should care because it's the first time it's ever happened in human history. Um, in just a few years, there'll be one out of five people over the age of 65 in this country. It's already happened in places like Japan and Germany and Italy and others. Um, but also because in just a few years after that, there'll be more people over the age of 65 than under 18, also a first time in history. So this period is really forcing us to rethink everything we know about society, economy, politics, and we need to come together in many ways to chart a new path forward as our demographic reality changes. Yeah, absolutely. I know I, I've been feeling it and certainly you look around and people are talking about how they want to be child free, not childless, child free. Right. So child there free. is a shift that's happening and I've heard it called the quote, silver tsunami, which is a different way of putting it, but it's yeah. real. And, it uh, is real. And, and, you know, the silver tsunami has always been a pejorative term. Um, yes, it really is. And it, because it signals destruction. Right. Um, I'm like, and, I don't like this. <laughs> but there, it's also not ter a terribly bad analogy um, when we boil it down, because if we keep everything the way it's always been, our economic norms, our social welfare norms, this change, this demographic shift will have catastrophic uh, consequences. And that is worrisome because we're not moving nearly as fast as we should to embrace what not the distant future, the near future is bringing. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's necessarily a bad term, but it's a bad term if we it's a, it's a bad term, bad thing if we keep our current realities in play. Absolutely. Our and current norms in play. And speaking as a, a former news person, I can tell you if it bleeds, it leads. So tsunami is yep. going to get you to wake up, right? Yep. In a way that other things might not necessarily do, unfortunately, Correct. human nature being what it is. But um, how do we get people, you know, absent having to use the term silver tsunami, how do we get people, how do we get society and how do we get employers to wake up to this reality that's already upon us? Well, how do we get people to get behind climate change? <laughs> It's the same question, uh, different subject matter. Uh, climate change and demographic change are sisters. They grew up together. They're byproducts of the industrial revolutions. Um, we just realized they were here at different times. We are in a place now with demographic change that is somewhat precarious. You know, we don't have an event horizon like the people who are talking about climate change did 35, 40 years ago. We're looking at a five or 10 year horizon before things really start to stick, where we really start to feel some of the pain associated with demographic change. The upside to this is that when business and society, even the government starts to feel, feel that pain, they start to move. So just as we've seen some movement, especially around business, even though some of it's performative around climate change, sustainability, the ESGs overall, that will stick eventually with demographic change too. And businesses will have no choice but to wake up to this reality um, and start thinking about their the way they operate differently. What does a worker life look like? Is it just up to 65 or does it blow past that? What do consumers look like? Are they just that classic 18 to 34 youth market that, that marketers drool over? 
Or are they this emerging class of people who are post 65 and living healthier and wealthier than ever before? Uh, or is it somewhere kind of in between? Um, because not all glitters that not all, all the, all that's gold is well, not all the glitters is gold rather, you know, there are, there are some realities that sit in this. It's not just a period that we can grab onto and say, Hey, this is going to be fantastic. It's also not a period that it's going to be just end of the world either. Right. Yeah. And I think what's, what's so interesting about this particular conundrum is like, we, I wonder if it's just this reckoning with mortality that I think is so, I won't say it's uniquely American, but I feel like mm-hmm. it's really imbued in, in American culture. Yeah. It's, it's centered, it's centered in human nature. Right. Uh, if you go back to antiquity, you'll find stories of people looking to solve for death essentially people who are looking for CEOs are still doing it. (laughs) Yeah. And people are still doing it. I mean, it's one of the things that drives us as human beings is to challenge our mortality and people have been doing it for millennia now. And I don't see any chance of that changing anytime (laughs) soon. In fact, there's a whole host of investors and scientists that are looking to break the age code. They're no longer looking at aging as a process, which is kind of fundamental to our understanding of what aging is they're starting to look at aging as a disease. Mm. And if they can treat that disease, well, that pushes off things like cancer, heart disease, et cetera, um, organ failure, perhaps, um, and could allow people to live indefinitely, certainly if you believe the theorists. Um, but mortality is part of the human condition. Um, and there has always been a finite point in which we can no longer go past. Um, and throughout all of history, Every every recorded death, you know, the 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 highest point has really been around 120, maybe 122. So, well, there's belief that we've already passed that threshold and that the first person living today will reach 150. The question is, okay, so then what? So, (laughs) if we live 150 years, um, but we maintain our current social and economic norms. What will that do to our our nations? What will that do to our economies? Well, the short answer is um, it destroys them. Because if we retire people at 65, which has been the de facto norm for the 20th century and the 21st century, well, the economy comes to a halt real quick, especially in an era where we're not having a lot of children. We're not necessarily replacing the population. We're not growing as a country or growing as society. And imagine, I mean, just imagine for a moment, you work for a 40-year career, that kind of traditional model. In the new model where you live to 120, you are retired longer than you are working by a significant margin. It just, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, it doesn't pass the sniff test of what, what reality should be or what reality can be. No, certainly not. And I can tell you, speaking on behalf of many millennials and then the younger generations, I would think most certainly, I don't have the anticipation that I will be propped up by things like social security and whatnot. Yeah, and listen, I'm not, I never make the argument that we should do away with social security. Like social security is a very important program. Um, public benefits, uh, social welfare are very important to social cohesion and frankly, the way we operate as nations. My argument largely is that we need to reconsider what those look like. Um, the world is a lot different than it was in 1935. Our demographics are much different than they were in 1935. The human life course has largely changed since 1935. So why haven't the programs? Right. And the rate in which things like Social Security, the eligibility age is increasing, is happening at a rate slower than change. So that's part of what's driving the um, insolvency of these programs is that change hasn't met reality. And that's why, you know, in a couple of years, you know, between 2030 and 2034, both Social Security and Medicare will no longer be solvent in this country is because we haven't kept up with reality. That's why, you know, Gen X, millennials, Gen Z consistently say, you know, we know Social Security isn't going to be there for us in the current scheme. Right. I think it should be there for us. But okay. should it be should it be there for us at 65? Probably not. Yeah. Uh not for not for the average person. Yeah. 
Yeah. And certainly not for those people that are living this new longevity who blow past 65 in great health, great wealth, um, that are maintaining their working lives. Um, those people shouldn't necessarily be retiring anymore. Right. And yet there's so much intergenerational conflict and anger that's being hurled at one generation from another and and for various reasons, right? And ultimately, if we don't start shifting the way we approach others, uh, just generally, right, as human beings, but others in other generations in different stages of their lives, we're going to be in a whole heap of trouble. And I think about, you know, what would have to change to get people, especially in the tech industry that just worships at the altar of youth for mm -hmm. sure, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what will it take to get us to shift the way in which we perceive others? Like you said, people are living longer, healthier lives. What 65 is today is not what it looked like yesterday, right? Well, I think market forces are driving us there. Um, I also am not sure I fully buy into this intergenerational conflict piece. Um, oh, interesting. Data doesn't necessarily suggest that that's a reality. Um, and certainly when you look, take a look at some of the seminal moments over the past five years, when you think about things like BLM and the protests following George Floyd, you actually saw through cellular data that the people that were showing up at the protests were either older adults or younger adults. They weren't people that were sitting in the middle. Mm -hmm. And that shows that there is room for intergenerational solidarity. There is Hopefully. room for, for people to work young and old side by side. But there's also just an economic reality that's coming for business. And if businesses are forced, let's say forced, because that's really the pressure that they're under right now, to recruit and retain an age diverse workforce, well, then you'll be working side by side by somebody. You'll see that they have productive opportunity and they can contribute. And that then starts to wash away to some degree this, this tension that may exist between generations. Um, Within the workforce, a lot of this conflict that bubbles up comes from one place, and that's communications. Um, we do communicate differently by generation. Um, we grew up in different eras that had different communications tools, and therefore we apply those to our working lives. So there are some stereotypes there that, that I think are actually quite fair. You know, Gen Z is a highly digital generation. They communicate primarily on their devices. But... You take a look at boomers, our, our oldest workers, and some silent generation are still in the workforce too. You know, they grew up in an analog world. So conversation is more important. A phone call has more weight than an email or a Slack or a text. So solving that communications piece is, is, is really important. From a management perspective in work, there are biases that are problematic. Um, you know, we're talking about people who are managers are like 35 to 55. They tend to hire for people that, that look and act and sound like them. Um, when they think about an older worker, they're thinking about a lot of the biases associated with an older worker, including negative biases that have been built in, you know, really for most of the 20th century, the idea that older workers aren't necessarily flexible, that older, older workers aren't necessarily tech savvy, um, that older workers are slower. Um, these don't necessarily line up with what the data suggests overall. Now, it's always important to note that, that the data suggests what the norms are. Um, there are always going to be bad workers and good workers, regardless of their age. So anyone who argues, well, older workers are the best thing ever, well, that's faulty. There are some really phenomenal older workers. There are some really terrible older workers. Just like you're going to find some really phenomenal Gen Zs and some really terrible Gen Zs, there is a spectrum within each generation. So I always encourage employers to really consider the whole person, not just what their age is, but also what their work experience has been and the type of job that they're looking to do. The one piece, the one comment I hear back from older workers who have not gotten to the next level in a job or have been passed over for a job or a promotion um, is often that they're overqualified. Well, that is the most absurd thing I've ever heard. Couldn't agree with like, you. We want experience. We need experience in our workplaces. It's a component of diversity and inclusion. Okay. And with that built in, not only do we build better products and services, we tend to have better um, outcomes and operational resilience. 
But also we've got this whole new category of people that are part of this cohort that is growing. Yep. You know, as a total, 65 plus is the fastest growing demographic in the country. Um, if you slice it even further and just look at smaller demographics, 85 plus is growing even faster than 65 plus. Wow. So we are talking about a really big shift in the makeup of our society. We should be able to tap into its economic potential too. And one statistic that I read the other day was that 83% of Gen Z is hopeful to find a mentor within the work organization in which they are. Uh, 83%. And yet only 52% of Gen Z says that they have a mentor. Correct. So we are missing out on what seems to be a really valuable relationship in the workplace. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what are your thoughts on how we can encourage companies to focus a little bit more on inculcating a mentorship program? Well, you know, business in many ways, I wouldn't say entirely, but, but large swaths of it gave up on mentorship a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of business spent most of the 20th century getting rid of older workers that, that, that had great experience. Um, they can offer those mentorship type relationships, you know, in 1950, one out of two men over the age of 65 was in the formal labor market, 50%. When I entered the labor market, it was one out of eight, 15%. Um, today it's better. It's, it's, it's closer to 20, 25%. That's, that's a big improvement. Um, but it's still not where it needs to be. Um, we also have this built-in bias over time, this ageist bias that that suggests that older workers don't have that ability to really be part of our companies. So these mentorships, I think, if mentorship programs have largely flailed, but when they work and when they are actually levered, levered rather, they're they're quite spectacular. Um especially when we go past the traditional top-down mentorship relationship and we consider mutual mutual mentorship. So where, you know, hypothetical, it's not so much a hypothetical, it's a real story. There was a, a carpentry in Germany called Bramertz. Um, and one day an 82-year-old man walked up to the front door and he said, um, do you have work for an old carpenter here? And they hired him. He was a master carpenter. Um, and he was placed with uh, a student in training, so a 16-year-old. And they worked side by side, creating some phenomenal product for this company. Why was it so special? Well, old work techniques and new world techniques were able to marry, finding that perfect balance between um, what was new and what was old, um, what was a classic way of doing things and what was a new way of doing things. We took the best from both worlds within that company. It's a small company, um, but the learnings are applicable to any size enterprise because when you line up these skill sets, you can get something really special out of them. Um, and that's something we should all be focusing on going forward. I think that's part of what, you know, being really smart in the, the new world of work looks like is having that openness to the diversity of experiences that your coworkers bring to the table, but not just the diversity of experiences, the diversity of realities that they face every day. You know, some of the, some of the conflict that, that you alluded to earlier, you know, might stem from, you know, Mrs. Jones leaves a Friday a week to take care of her husband or get her husband to the hospital or to doctor's appointments. Well, you know, um, Mrs. Smith, who might be 40 years younger, might have to get out of work a couple of days a week to pick up her kids from school. Like they're both in need of flexibility. We all need flexibility. So like lean into that. Don't, don't, don't beat up on your coworker because their, their, their living realities, their life realities are different than yours. Right. And, and yeah, that's something that I've always tried to think of as well. When I think about the fact that I do have children and I need to make certain allowances and have certain flexibility in my working life in order to accommodate that, I think, you know, well, I might have some colleagues of the younger demographic who might not be parents. Maybe they choose to be, you know, child free or maybe they're just not there yet. Right. And it's something that's coming down the line for them. I try to remember that they are allowed to have flexibility too. They are allowed to opt out of certain things because they have whether it's a yoga class or, or whatever other sort of thing in their lives, mine is not necessarily more important than theirs. Like we have to make sure that we are allowing for all different sorts of experience and, and all different sorts of, uh, of, of activities and responsibilities that people have regardless of age. This is where managers really need to pivot. Um, we, we know that people want flexibility in the workforce, right? 
Um, yet most managers are still working off of a model where we count hours. Right. And that doesn't necessarily jive with where we're headed. Um, we also know that some people work more efficiently than others. Um, while some may take more time to get a higher quality product. Like what we need to consider is less about counting hours in the work week and more about judging on outcomes. Yes. Results only work environments, right? Yeah. Results only work environments are a big part of this. And it is very hard to argue with the outcomes, with the results. Um, You can negotiate the hours piece till you're blue in the face, but if there is a level understanding between manager and employee and among staff, well, that to me is how you get to this solution at a, at a quicker pace. Um, you know, for me, you know, the people that work with me, we're, we're all project based. Um, I'm not concerned about when people take vacation. I'm not concerned about when people have to get out to, to, to take care of loved ones. That's just not important. Um, the product is what's important. That's what, that's what I'm paying you for. I love that. I think that's really an important shift in my, there's a, there's a caveat here, of course, like this doesn't work in every work environment. (laughs) Um, this gets harder, the bigger the company is because companies have to have rules. It also gets harder depending on industry. So if I was running, let's say fast food restaurants across Washington, DC, this type of work would be nearly impossible. We have to count hours. Because it's front facing, it's in, it's it's working with people, um, producing a service uh, direct to the customer. That so it doesn't work perfectly in every environment, but that doesn't mean the businesses aren't trying. You know, even Chick Fil A um, has been making some strides in creating more flexible work environments. And many, you know, uh, experts in human resources said, well, there's just certain jobs that can't be flexible. No, there are certain jobs that can't be flexible outside of white collar work if we're thinking of white collar work as the standard. Right. But other working or the jobs can have flexibility too. It just won't look like the people who are nine to five in an office setting. Yeah, it'll be slightly different. I'm glad you brought up industries because I'm curious your thoughts on the tech industry specifically with regard to how they're doing at absorbing this message of the super age uh, versus some other industries. Impressive. Yeah, it's like it's like a uh, tech industry. Are, are you okay? Like <laughs> they're not. They're not. Like I have. It, it's rare that you see an industry so blind to the future, especially one that is fixated on the future. Exactly. It 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 doesn't <laughs> make any sense. So uh, you know, it's an industry that's still dominated by young um, men. Um, there has been some racial diversity. Uh, but very little gender diversity um, and zero age diversity. It is appalling. (laughs) And what worries me about this is not only is tech as an industry missing out on a real opportunity here, not just from a workforce perspective, but also from a customer perspective. Yes. That's problematic. I mean, you have people like Mark Zuckerberg, you know, good on him for all the the big change and the big money he's made. But Mark Zuckerberg, if, like he recoils when you talk about older customers. Guess who's on his platforms? Older customers. Exactly. Facebook is meta, whatever the heck they call themselves these days. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a boomer platform now. <laughs> yes, and, and, and Instagram, I mean, I'm a Gen X. Instagram is a Gen X platform yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and millennial to some degree, you know, younger people are showing up in droves on TikTok. Yeah. Um, and of course that's changing. There's more diversity there in terms of user groups. What makes me anxious though, is that age, ageism is a bias. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not parallel to racism or uh, homophobia or, or sexism, but it is a bias. And when a monolithic group, young men in particular, are building things. They're building their biases into things, including artificial intelligence. Yes. And this is just a PSA here. Like, <laughs> if more diverse thought isn't built into AI, we are screwed. I couldn't agree with you more. Bias inputs, bias outputs. That's what it yeah. is. Yeah. And like, 
the worst part about AI is it's not that it's not just the people who are building it. It's also the sources of data that they're pulling from. So, for example, like um, and the government's made some good strides on this, but even for clinical trials for drugs, like there's not a diverse representation necessarily in all clinical um, drug trials. So if it's a it's a waterfall effect. Yeah. So if AI is pulling from the clinical trials and the outcomes from the tr- clinical trials and then delivering information, you're doubly biased here. Yep. So if you're an older adult, you might be getting an output that says you should do one thing um, that might be completely contrary to what your doctor and for those people in extreme old age, your geriatrician might tell you. Yeah, it has really harmful effects, like not getting ahead of this. And, and you know, I keep on thinking to myself, like, what could possibly go wrong? You know, we have essentially an arms <laughs> race. That a, is lot, a lot can go wrong. Like, come on, we've seen this movie before. Like, I, I don't want to be a part of it. And it just it's it's shocking to me that here we are yet again, just kind of descending. Well, in. Yeah. And I think what we've learned about, you know, the Internet in particular, um, but also social media is that it's nearly impossible to put the genie back on the bottle. It really is. It really is. And yet here we are. And yet here we are. And what <laughs> businesses, and it doesn't matter what industry, because it's pretty consistent across all industries. Tech is just the um, just the worst in terms of how it deals with age, is that they're missing this fundamental truth that every year our birth rates decline. So... Gen Z is roughly the same size as Gen X, which is a very small generation, mind you, about 69 million people. Gen Alpha will be sizably smaller than Gen Z. And we'll see if there's this magic turnaround. I don't expect it to because we're looking at a 250-year downward trend in birth rates. I don't expect that turns around magically overnight. I think so. They're not exactly selling having children these days and the cost no, it's of not the, what the, it is, inflation, the, et cetera. It's not, it's not really a... Yeah, the value prop for having kids is way off. Way down. Um, so for businesses to really thrive in the new period, it's not just about, okay, well, we're going to go after older customers and we're going to build something specifically for them. It's really how do you build the wants, needs, and desires of people who are living this new longevity, who are older, into the products you're already designing? How do you build them into their marketing strategies? Like, that's how you get there. But the only way you do it successfully is involve them as workers in your company. Yes, yes exactly. How on the only way you get there. Yes. How are you going to speak to them if you don't have them within the four walls of your company? You, you can't. You know, I think, about, I think about the fact that like today, like, if I, if somebody said, Brad, I'd, I'd like you to design a toy, like I could hearken back to memories of my childhood <laughs> and I could say, yeah, that's the kind of toy I'd really like. <laughs> but if somebody asked me, build a product for an older adult, the hubris it would take for me to design something from scratch, having not experienced that, that, that life and that process of, of becoming an older adult, the hubris is unbelievable. So the companies that are really excelling here and capturing this marketplace, expanding their customer base, their inclusive design, these are the companies that are saying, yes, we want older workers. Yes, we want diverse user groups at the table. Yes, we want to co-create. Those are the companies that will in the future. And we've seen it in places like Japan, where companies ignored the demographic reality. Japan is the oldest country on the planet now, with nearly a third of their population over 65. Those companies that ignored the shift away from a large number of children to one of a large number of adults, they went out of business. So Japan is in many ways a canary in our economic coal mine of what we can expect if we don't think about this shift in a meaningful way, in a way that we can really say, okay, there is a period here that we can really profit from going forward. This is about money. This is about, this is about feeling good. This is about wealth creation. I also think, you know, there, there, is, a, there is a subtext to this too, um, because what follows aging society? depopulation. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing countries go through this now. You know, Japan lost a population the size of Las Vegas last year. Mm -hmm. China, the one the size of San Francisco. Russia has been losing population since 1992. This is changing the way these countries operate. So 
we're fortunate here in the States. Um, I assume most of this audience is in the States. We're fortunate here because we still have positive immigration. Canada is the same way. We are still bringing in people. So we can still continue to grow, even though we're getting older. These other countries, it is a very different scenario. But they offer us um, indications of what can be done right and wrong because they're so far ahead of us yeah. in this demographic shift. Business needs to learn from these folks. They need to learn from these nations. They need to learn from the businesses in these countries because that gives us incredible market intelligence of what our future could be. Absolutely. And as you so rightly underscored, it is all about money. And certainly in tech, shareholder value creation is everything. They don't care about literally anything else. So what are some of the lessons that can be delivered to the tech industry with regard to what's on the table economically if they don't make the shift? The biggest one is that you're excluding a massive market. Um, you're alienating current and future customers. Period. Um, we've seen this time and time again in how products are delivered. And I think perhaps the most pointed example of this isn't a product, it was a service. But it was a service that needed tech for its delivery. And that was the initial COVID vaccine. The initial COVID vaccine was deployed primarily to people over the age of 85 first, then 65. But that first wave, nearly in every state, required you use a mobile phone or a computer. Yeah. Guess who has relatively low tech utilization? The over 85s. So there was this massive disconnect between what people had and what were willing to use in terms of a scheduling tool and what the government and tech by default was telling them they needed to use to register to get their vaccine, which would save their life. Oh, brilliant example. So like there's, there's where some of the disconnect is. That's a very pointed example of it, but it highlights the, the, the reality that if we aren't considering these disparate populations that may have different ways of approaching and using tech, and we only design for what we think 20-somethings want, we miss the mark. So if you didn't have, if you were an older adult, specifically one in advanced stage during the first uh, rollout of the COVID vaccine, if you didn't have a, a loved one who was tech literate and, True. and had the device, yep. you were unable to get a vaccine. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I think of how much we put on... I mean, how awful is that? I mean, how, 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 but it really gets to bias. It just yeah. really gets to that fundamental piece of bias of missing the mark. Now, this is an extreme example. It's also a life and death example. And does business care about life and death? Well, I think they would if they're worried about losing customers, yeah. but we're talking about business survival here for the yeah. future. Every industry will experience demographic change differently. Every business, depending on its geographic location, will experience this shift differently. If you're in a big city, if you're, if you're in SF, Chicago, New York, DC, these cities are young. Mm -hmm. They're young cities with a lot of young people coming in, but you do not have to go too far out of these big cities to find populations that have the same makeup by age group as Japan. Yeah. Yeah. Where one, at least one out of three people is over the age of 65. It is within these places, states like Maine and Vermont, where you're starting to see the economy turn. They're turning towards greater age inclusion. They're turning towards building products and services that consider older adults. In Maine, they've even gone so far as to say, we're going to be the first state to stamp out ageism. Wow. Why are they doing that? It isn't altruism. <laughs> Few things, right? It, no. It's economic survival. How do we keep this thing running the way it should? Wow. wow. And the way you do that is by bringing people in as workers and consumers. It is the equivalent of jumping from an airplane with a parachute or a rock. <laughs> States like Maine have said, we're going to jump with a parachute. We will ease this transition into our new demographic reality. Other places, other states haven't leaned into that. The cities have largely ignored it. Um, ironically, the cities are where a lot of the big businesses. 
So they're missing out on this economic opportunity that sits in smaller cities across the country and even in rural rural counties. I mean, tech is just, I don't get it. It's I mean, insane. The only thing, the only thing that expresses the problem with tech is that there has been a continual migration of young people into the Bay Area to work in tech. Yeah. That's part of where the bias builds from. Totally. Like, I can't blame tech entirely for this. No. They have a steady stream of workers. Yeah. And by the way, the workers are probably a little bit more affordable. That is always, 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 always part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. They're cheaper. Yep. And does tech rely on experience in the builds? Does new tech, new platforms require experience? For some, yes. For others, maybe not. Yeah. So I think tech is not doing right by its own business model for the yeah. future, but I completely understand what they see. They see yeah. affordable labor coming in. Malleable too. Malleable, freshly minted mm -hmm. from academic programs. Yeah. Hungry. Mm -hmm. all, um, those, all those coded words, right? <laughs> well, I mean, well, I mean, there's a lot of, but also their, their, their truths here, you know, yeah, they're, awesome. they're single you know, like mm -hmm. the benefits that they built in because of this steady stream of workers benefits this young worker more than it benefits a person who has a family, a exactly. person who might be older. Like, your options aren't going to feed your family, you know, like, come no. on. No, there's a reality like, to this too. Uh -huh. There are just, and that's why I, I, I really try to give everyone an ounce of grace in this. This is new. Yeah. This is, we've never experienced anything like this before. No. And the only time when the world population ever reversed prior to this, and we're getting close to that point where the global population stops growing, was during the Black Plague. Oh my. And that was a singular event, a singular event which reversed world population. Mm -hmm. It wasn't due to births and it wasn't this long term. Like I said, this has been happening for about 250 years. We're really only now seeing it catch up with us. So everyone gets a bit of grace in this. Yeah. You know, anyone who's, uh, you know, attacks somebody for, for, for being ageist, give them a little grace. Like exactly. if the person's a jerk, <laughs> call them out for being a jerk. But like people need a little grace here. Um, this is all new for business too. So if your business, uh, doesn't see the value of older workers, help them see it. Yep. Yep. Like be an advocate for change. Don't be an adversary. I love that. Um, that's yeah. just my perspective. You know, right. I, I guess I, I guess I follow that, that old rule of thought. You get more flies with honey. Yeah. So, <laughs> even though you tend to get more flies with vinegar, but that's beside the point. <laughs> I'm just going to leave that there. But no, yeah. the truth is, I mean, we are all grappling with our own internalized ageism, which has been inculcated in us since basically we were born. So, I mean, we do, like you said, have to have a, a great degree of compassion for others as well as self-compassion. We're all still trying to figure out what exactly we do <laughs> with, with these feelings and this coming to terms, right? Also, just remember that our our generations... The generations preceding us were raised on this notion there will always be a lot of kids and we would be in a period of perpetual growth because yeah. society has always oh, yeah. grown. That is upended itself. Yeah. So we are also dealing with the reality that we've got people who are running businesses in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who grew up with this idea that that there would always be people behind them, large numbers of people behind yeah. them. And that's just not the case. Yeah. This is why we have part of the reason why we have 10 million jobs open in this country right now. Wow. It's not just a skills mismatch. There are people looking to work that can't get jobs in large part because they're deemed as too old, overqualified, blah, 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 blah. It's a huge problem. It's huge. <laughs> it's huge. But it can be fixed and it will be fixed because the pressures will come at some point for people to look outside the traditional labor pool. Yeah. Who does this benefit in the short term or the longer term? It benefits older workers who are already coming back to the workforce in mass. Um, we expect our own Bureau of Labor Statistics expects that, that the 65 plus group will grow by 25% in 10 years and wow. nearly a hundred percent for the 75 plus. Wow. That's good news. Um, 
but it will be these economic pressures that will force business and individuals to get yeah. back to work. So in some ways, do you believe that ultimately this will be a self-correcting issue? Oh, there's nothing that's perfectly self-correcting here. Like <laughs> there needs to be advocacy here. There needs to be advocacy. There needs to be visionaries, people who can see what the future looks like. Those are essential elements to this. Um, there also need to be the businesses that are willing to take a little risk. Like this might not feel right to you. Um, this might make you feel a little nervous. Um, but those businesses that try will likely see a better outcome in the coming years because they're going to be ahead of the curve. They're going to know what this market of people demands. They're not going to know how to build better inclusion, not only into their workplaces, but also into their products and services. Um, you know, 15 years ago, I'll, I'll leave with this just so you have it. Uh, and it's, it's in the book as well. When Japan shifted from having more older people than younger people, we knew it was coming for years. It, 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 you can't lie. Demographics, you can't ignore. Like, they're numbers. And we know what the numbers are. And our countries are really good at capturing the numbers. So we know how many births there are. We know how many deaths there are every year. We know it by month. Still, they put off doing anything big around demographic change in Japan. Well, what's one industry that is impacted most by there being fewer babies? Diapers. We knew for years that the number of diaper users, uh, diapers being sold was going to decrease, was decreasing because the birth rate was decreasing. What some manufacturers missed is that because there was a surging older, particularly a geriatric population, the growth in adult continents was, was growing. Now, some, some businesses pivoted to that. Others didn't. Guess who survived? That is a great example. Now, it's one that makes us feel a little icky, I'm sure. Yeah, but no one, no one it is a, that, but it is life. it is part of life mm -hmm. and it is part of what a demographic transition could look like. An extreme example, but applied to any other industry. Children's toys. Children's programming on TV. Like your audience is changing. So if you're an employee and you notice this dearth of workers across the age spectrum, do you have any advice for how people can bring this up with their employer? Yeah, it's, this is a <laughs> sticky area. Thorny. Um, it's thorny. You know, I, I think that there are businesses that are making a good faith effort to at least um, build support for generations internally. Uh, in fact, just a few weeks ago, I spoke with CVS Health that actually has their own employee resource group uh, for uh, generations to come together. They're not alone. Uh, other businesses like Wells Fargo have this in place too. There are businesses that are considering this. Um, that is a place to start. If your business doesn't have one, consider starting one. Uh, you typically need the support uh, of a C-suite executive, if not the HR department to get it off the ground, but it is an awareness tool. Um, other ERGs that actually present a real opportunity to learn from generational diversity are um, ERGs that are developed around caregiving. Mm, yeah. And that may seem like a reach, but we have this idea of what a caregiver looks like and, you know, middle-aged woman um, is the de facto. Um, but I just was in conversation with Shauna, um, Shauna Sweeney over at Tender the other day, the founder and CEO of Tender, a new caregiving platform. And she's a meta ex. Um, and I asked her about what happened at, at, at Meta. And she said, I started this employee resource group for caregivers. And I thought, wow, I'm just going to get caregivers to look at me. And she said, it was incredibly diverse. Generationally, um, uh, gender wise, like it, it broke some stereotypes there. So it isn't just a generations group that can get you started. It's also um, it's also maybe a caregiving group or maybe another group that's looking at um, some very pointed issues within the workplace. That's a really great point. And I think one thing that I've run into actually beginning this podcast and, and getting people to be aware of it is, is the difficulty with <laughs> approaching people of a certain age and being like, hey, you should listen to this because you're 
getting older, since we have such a negative association with that, people won't opt in. So that's kind of like a Trojan horse way. Let's talk about caregiving and that will bring in people of a certain age, right? It is so hard for people to see their future selves. It really is. So selling this idea that you're going to be old one day, it doesn't, it doesn't stick. No. Mm -mm. It doesn't stick. Yeah. I mean, nobody believes it, Mm -mm. you know, uh, forever young. I want to be forever young. I mean, this, this mantra of youth and our, you know, and our, our ability to kind of fight against it centers in our consciousness the reality is we all wake up one day and somebody sees us as older than we think we are. I think that there's greater opportunity by, by leveraging things like mentorship, which we highlighted earlier, but also allyship and finding those handful of younger workers. I think caregiving is a very interesting place where you can find those people that are willing to stand up against ageism, willing to promote an age diverse working environment. And within just about any, any enterprise, you're going to find one or two managers that get it. And those one or two managers that really believe in the future, understand the future, um, this demographic reality that we're barreling towards and are already quietly building their intergenerational teams. They exist. These people exist. Um, Seek those folks out. Every organization to this date that has transitioned to an age diverse workforce has had one champion. And it's one champion that has had some influence on operations. And they were able to make those small changes to the way the company behaved within their own thing that they controlled. And then it bled into others. And the perfect case in point in that is the this guy who was running HR for BMW. He's featured in my book uh, at this production facility in Dingdolfing, Germany. And he said, wow, we, we need age diversity in the workforce. Essentially, we need to extend the working lives of the people that are here. Overnight, um, when they made these adjustments, they saw worker productivity increase, happiness increase, quality of product increase it increased over time they saw inclusive innovations being built into the cars you know where he is today he's their chief operating officer oh wow That's so cool. he was rewarded <laughs> he was rewarded so businesses need to reward managers who are able to make these changes uh he was also able to show a pretty great outcome at the end of the day so there has to be outcomes associated with this I think people fall into the trap more times than not that this is a good thing to do and we should just move on it because it's a good thing to do. That's not the way the business world works. You need to be able to illustrate an ROI or an improvement in a process for somebody to take you seriously. If you walk into HR tomorrow and say, we need to hire more older workers, they will laugh you out the door. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. They'll just laugh you out the door. If you do it to a C-suite exec, they'll laugh you out the door. So building that case around inclusion, which is significant, we've gotten to that case around diversity, equity, inclusion as it, as it relates to race and gender, a certain sexual identity and, and, and sexual orientation. Uh, we're, we're there in business, but there's only about 8% of companies worldwide, big, big companies that is that actually think of age as a component of diversity. Exactly. And that to me is baffling. Um, And there are all these things that come with a long life in in a workplace too. We're not just talking about people who are 65 plus. We're talking about the fact that there are more women working now than ever before. So things like menopausal leave, which would have been laughable 10 years ago, it would have been laughable five years ago, now has stepped Uh, seeped into the consciousness of employers. Why did it do that? How did that happen? Well, employers now see a clear and present threat to losing mid-career, middle-aged women in the workplace. Yeah. So just just last year, uh, just in 2021, only 4% of American companies had a menopausal policy at work. I'm shocked it was that high. Well, it, it... it came from nowhere, but 4%. <laughs> it, 
it tripled in a year to 15%. And while you might say, oh, come on, Brad, 15% is terrible. It's 150 times better than zero, which it was just a few years ago. Like that's a, that's a pretty significant jump. It's huge. So the, here's the highlight. I think the positive side of this companies are starting to get it. Age diversity, age inclusion, it's happening slowly, but here's the one thing about American companies. They benchmark against each other. They benchmark against each other through a number of different measures, but in this one, they'll be looking at SHRM, Society for Human Resource Management in particular, to take a look at, you know, what is age diversity work? What's the benefit for companies at the end of the day? When you start seeing those big companies show up, big American companies doing this well, we're going to see a wholesale turn um, and businesses will embrace it more and more because they'll see it as a clear and present threat to their business operations and a clear and present opportunity to profit in the future. And and that's absolutely the reality here, which is why it's so shocking to me, as you so eloquently put it, that tech is so behind the times yet seeing itself as such an innovator, right? Like it's a disruptor as, as the change agent. And yet they're so behind here. And it really is it's not just the morally right thing to do. It's an economic imperative. And so you you have beautifully, beautifully explained exactly why that is. And your book is excellent and I'm enjoying it very much and haven't quite finished it yet, but I'm going to, Um, (laughs) but you you have an excellent take on all this. And I think you, you give a lot of, of really important statistics in here that indicate that we have a lot of work to do. And as you put it, companies won't move until they see the financial necessity to do so. And so I look forward to seeing those sort of beacons, those shining examples of companies that are doing this well, so that we can get a lot more to follow suit and emulate the way in which they're behaving. That's going to benefit absolutely all of us, right? So not just financially, but also emotionally, because we're all having to deal with our own sort of coming to terms with what aging is and our part in this sort of system, right? Well, we all want to roll at the end of the day. Yeah. We all want to feel human. We all want to be part of the pack. We all want to have purpose. That does not have an expiration date. The Mm -hmm. fact that we push people out really, I think, caused harm to our society and our economy that we haven't fully come to realize yet what was lost over that period just by the overt exclusion of people. Um, It was an unintended consequence of policy that was really designed to help people survive in later life, but it turned on its head. Yeah. Um, An entire retirement industry was built out of it. Bias, which let's be honest, ageism has always been around in some form, Mm -hmm. but it never really metastasized like it did in the 20th century. And the economy uh, in large part will force us back into a reality where people work uh, largely until they cannot anymore. And there isn't an age expiration date on your productive opportunity. That doesn't exist. That's a construct. You're able to contribute until you can't. For some people, that could be 45. For other people, heck, the president's 82 years old. (laughs) It could be even higher than that. So try to beat that bias when you can. Um, look at what the productive opportunity of an individual is, what, what they can give back. And, you know, certainly as a business owner, as a manager, consider whether or not the working relationship that you have with somebody should be full-time, should be part-time, should be flexible. Like consider the needs of the individual. Absolutely. There's more than one way to do business. And I'm glad that you pointed out the fact that there is the possibility of doing more of a consultative gig work type of engagement, right? Versus necessarily having everybody be a full-time employee. So we're we're even seeing that in Japan. Like, like, you know, we think about Japan as being kind of tight on this. They have a fairly strict retirement age, Mm -hmm. but even Japan business is starting to come around on this now. You know, there, there are great examples, uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries is highlighted in my book that talk, they, they, they retire people at this traditional age, about 65 years old. But then once you retire, you're able to join their consultancy overnight. And that allows you income security. It also allows you to continue working, having a purpose with the company. 
but also a flexible schedule, which I think is pretty cool. Do I think that just retiring somebody at 65 makes sense? No. But is this one glimmer of hope for how business could operate in the future? Yeah, 100% it is. Yeah, we we all have to take a big mental shift here, I think, in how we approach the way in which we conceive of older people and and what we expect of them. And, you know, I, I consider how often you hear people getting, quote, pushed out of the workforce and you know, the concept of like move over and let a new generation come through. It's it, it's creeping down in terms of age in the tech industry. I mean, you, you, I can't tell you how many people have reached out to me as listeners and said that they've heard these overtly ageist things in job you know, interviews and, you know, within the workplace, it's, it's, it's a real thing. And yeah. so I think we have to start opening our minds with regard to what the expectation of, of certain ages is and how long we can have a contributing part to the workforce. So it's, I mean, it's just shifting so fast. I mean, you think even just media representation from a generation ago to today oh. and how you're portrayed in your fifties, it was like the golden girls last generation. And now it's, and just like that, the sex of the city reboot, right. And the way I, I mean, the golden bachelor, even like all yeah. these sort of pop culture phenomena are yeah. showing us that there's a new way to age and that yeah. your useful yeah. and, you know, exciting life does not end at 40 or 50. Right. Right. Yeah, and we're breaking we're breaking the 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 wheel, so yeah. to speak, um, for what bias has been for seventy five years or so, yeah. and that's a good thing. It does not happen overnight. No, and I know people wish it happened it three days ago or, or, or <laughs> yeah, two years ago. Yeah. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a drip, drip, drip. But well, we're that's getting the thing. There. I think we need to to celebrate the wins, however small they are, right? Yeah. And you know, some people say, "Well, oh, but that portrayal was ageist in X way, shape, or form." And I'm like, "Well, right. isn't it better than having like no representation at all? Like, don't yeah. we just count the micro wins? Like, we're getting somewhere." To your point about now, we have what 15 percent of workplaces in the U.S. that have a menopause sort of allowance <laughs> for women. Yeah. Like, that's yeah. massive, and yeah, it's still we have 85 percent of the way to go. But my gosh, yeah. let's celebrate. Well, we can like we're shifting yeah. the status quo. That's awesome. Count the wins, keep up <laughs> the fight. The Stay Count positive. the wins, keep up the fight. I love it. So part of the work that you do, Bradley, is is inclusion design. And can you tell the audience a little bit about what that means and some of the outcomes that you've been able to architect? Sure. So we're we're we 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 realize that that as we live, as we get older, um, we encounter space differently than we did when we were younger. And, and most yeah, just physical space, buildings, uh, communities, streetscapes. We realize that um, these changes do come over time, but most space isn't built with uh, disability or, or as I like to say, the human condition in mind. Accessibility is largely an afterthought to design. And that's highly problematic because as our population gets older, so will the number of people with disability grow. Right. The percentage will grow too. So there's about 61 million Americans living with some form of disability today. Right. That number will grow in the coming years. More importantly, though, the percentage will grow. And this is everything. This is people who are, are using wheelchairs, walkers, canes, um, people who are blind, glassware, hearing aids, et cetera. But it also includes people who are having functional cha functional differences, uh, cognitive ability, neurodiversity. Um, those are important components of this as well. So we work with architects and designers to build awareness around this, um, largely by pulling in this diverse user group of people living with some form of disability into the design process, uh, pushing past ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and really creating spaces that are not just functional and accessible, but also beautiful. Uh, because largely the medical model has been where we centered, um, which is not something people like. No one likes to be reminded that they're disabled, um, especially older adults. And we center around spaces that are really beautiful because we want everyone to enjoy them. So the design process is, is fairly straightforward. We have some basic standards that we've developed at the super age, along with some other leading organizations around neurodiversity and cognition, strength and dexterity, 
uh, mobility, um, hearing, and vision. Um, those are our baseline. These are what we work from. They're already well past what ADA offers. But in order to get it really right, we pull in diverse user groups because that allows us not only to experience their lived experience in real time, we get their feedback in real time. Yeah. But the best part about it is we're actually able to explore intersectionality. Uh-huh. Glad you brought it And that that's what's often missed. So I, I tell the story a lot because I think it's really a perfect case um, of what what's wrong with accessibility right now. Uh, at, at American Airlines Lounge at Washington National Airport, they just laid out this new design. It's beautiful. It's warm. It's dark stone and lots of art. And mm-hmm. it's kind of moody with leather seats. Like all of it looks like really it. pretty. <laughs> But I'm, you know, a stickler for 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 looking at what's wrong with the space because that's my, <laughs> that's my <your> business. <laughs> and I sought out the accessible bathroom. And I walked into the accessible bathroom and I just I just dropped my jaw because it was perfect for a wheelchair user. It had the right layout, it had the right uh, grab bars, the toilet was at the right height, the sink was had the right right um uh, height to it. Everything worked, except it was all black and it had low lighting. Yeah. So if you had any vision challenge, and I'm pretty good vision. I wear wear glasses to read and to drive. Um, I couldn't navigate the space. Mm. So it was your classic moment of really cool, beautiful looking design, but didn't actually work for a majority (laughs) of the population. Exactly. That's what we want to break. Yeah. We want to break it because if we have this good design, this inclusive design built into our workplaces, restaurants, retail, hospitality, wow, more people can work, more people can enjoy, more people can consume. So that's what we're pressing for. Um, and we are working with some big companies, obviously uh, disclosing them is problematic because they're all <laughs> under NDA. Um, but I think you're gonna see some pretty amazing stuff coming out in some pretty big companies in the next few years. That is very hopeful and uplifting. And I think it's a perfect sort of end point to our discussion because I want to leave people with a sense that it's going to get better. And it sounds like the work that you're doing is very much getting us towards that place. And we will have a lot of other companies emulating the work of of those with whom you work. So I'm very excited that you're out there doing this important service to frankly, all of us. And if we don't believe it's coming for us, well, got news for you, right? So thank you, Bradley. This is an awesome conversation, really eye-opening for me and for the audience, I'm sure. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate your time. 